it's really fun to be here. Uh, and it's fun to be uh, here on the same day Tim is here. Um, uh, some time ago, I was director of the San Diego Supercomputer Center, and Tim and I used to interact all the time. So he is helping you with answers today. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask a lot of questions today. And so hopefully, we'll compliment one another. So today, I wanted to talk about the Internet of Things. And, you know, every time you open the paper and in all of your jobs, I assume, you know, people are talking about the IoT and where we're going to go with it, what the next decade will do. We'll be empowering people through technology. We'll be uh, empowering uh, technology with intelligence. Um, adaptive systems will make a difference with us and will help us do uh, so many things better. We'll be able to customize and personalize things. You can have your own chocolate. You can make your own clothes on your 3D printer. Um, you can do a lot of things. We'll have smart technologies, and we'll be able to monitor things and optimize. So the promise of the Internet of Things is really an environment, an ecosystem, a society that's more effective, more adaptive, more optimized, and more helpful to us. At the same time, it's a good time to ask, before we've really built the IoT up to scale, who's going to make the rules for the IoT? So uh, smart cars, self-driving cars, can be a great boon to us. Um, there's also a downside to us. There was some really interesting uh, articles about how people hijacked a car um, through hacking it. Uh, people are hijacking baby monitors and cameras of various sorts. Um, we've just had a really new, interesting news article in the last couple of weeks um, positing whether Alexa actually called 911 and got the police to come with a domestic violence um, situation. So whether that actually happened or not, or whether Alexa received the instruction or not, we're just a hop, skip, and a jump from that scenario. And so who makes the rules for the Internet of Things, and when is it time to bring in those rules? After the Internet of Things is built, or while we're building it. And I'm going to try to make the case that we have to start now. We have to design the Internet of Things to support the kind of society and the kind of optimization we want from it. So how do we realize the vision of the Internet of Things? And it's hard for a whole bunch of reasons. First of all, the Internet of Things has a lot of entities in it. It has you and I. It has all of the devices. It has autonomous systems. It has organizations. It has nations. It has physical entities, and all of those things have to play together in some reasonably coordinated way. And we have to regulate all of them. So when we have rules and policies, it has to regulate the systems as well as the people in the Internet of Things. Those, the social rules, not just the technical rules, but the social rules have to address what's appropriate behavior for all of these devices and systems and people. What's inappropriate behavior? What's the public good? What do we do when something goes wrong? Who's accountable for it? Um, who, who worries about privacy? And you know, in our society, actually, government plays that role. In the ideal, what government's supposed to do is support the common good, support the public good in various kinds of ways, and then decide when individual rights and, and rights of the community, how to, how to balance those. And we have governments all over the world who do that in all kinds of different ways. Every time there's election in each one of those governments, you see different um, uh, options of that. This is not a political talk about so, uh, social governments. This is actually a ta uh, talk about the politics of the Internet of Things. How are we going to have governance there? So if you think about the Internet of Things, the technology roadmap is you know, sort of going crazy. It's sort of in the next decade or two or three, not just for us, but for our kids and grandkids, the Internet of Things is going to be a really ubiquitous, working, coordinated part of their life. And um, it's going to blend all these different kinds of systems, bi biological systems, et cetera. But what we'd like to do is have it be the effective, optimizing, um, really positive internet of things that we all hope it will be. And not Lord of the Flies, where your reputation uh, is, you know, somebody can hack uh, your cars, your reputation is not good, where your privacy is not upheld, etc. So as we start thinking about the internet of things and the kinds of rules we want, where should we go to even start thinking about this? Well, one thing you can do is sort of go and do what you do for governments for uh, social systems of human beings. 
So governance for social systems of human beings, the United Nations has done a lot of work, and kind of the big themes for laws and policy and regulation in governments all over the world are there's laws that deal with peace and security, there's laws that uh, deal with democracy and the rule of law, um, laws that deal with human rights and participation, a sustainable development, how do we make sure that our governments don't under, uh, overrun our natural resources, um, laws that deal with human development. And so all of these things are really important. So now let's map those laws onto the laws we'll need for the Internet of Things. And now in the IoT, we're going to need security. We need to know, can we trust the person on the other end of uh, that email? Uh, we have to deal with safety. We have to deal with cybercrime. We have to figure out what appropriate behavior is. We have to think of what the IoT Bill of Rights will be. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. We have to figure out what are the architectures of the IoT. How can we make sure that the IoT doesn't sap the resources of the natural world in ways that make it inappropriate for sustaining it throughout? We have to think about the ethics of IoT. You know, what are the ethics of our technologies? Why does that matter? If our technologies have intelligence, shouldn't they have ethics too? So we're going to have to start thinking of a lot of kind of strange and interesting things with respect to our technologies. So I thought I would just go through a bunch of them um, with you and, uh, and more to provoke your thinking as it's really provoking my thinking and a lot of other people. We do not have answers for this at this point. But there are a lot of questions we really need to start taking seriously for the IoT to be the IoT we hope it, it will be. So the first set of questions we might have would be about responsibility and accountability in the IoT. Who is responsible for, um, for things that autonomous systems do? And who's accountable when they go wrong? So self-driving cars are really a great example of that. So, you know, we're used to cars with autonomous systems. We've all been driving cars with, you know, cruise control and anti-lock brakes and things like that. But as the car becomes more and more capable of driving itself, perhaps without you not, without you even in the car, right? Um, what do we do? And what happens when that car gets in an accident? Is that okay with us? Um, we can't have it that zero cars, you know, that, that cars have to drive perfectly in the IT, but how many accidents for self-driving cars are going to be enough for us to sort of be worried about it or not? And those are the kinds of issues lots of states are thinking about. So when I start thinking about autonomous vehicles, vehicles that I might drive in are a whole network of vehicles that are exchanging information in order to make themselves safer. Who is responsible and accountable? So and if a, an autonomous vehicle gets in an accident, is it the programmer? Is it the manufacturer? Is it the person who could have intervened? Who is it? Now, we're actually, this is sort of, this is a, autonomous vehicles and drones are actually the point of the spear because we're actually starting to deal with policy and regulation in a lot of states and around the world. And you can kind of see from this map that a lot of states actually have laws having to do with autonomous vehicles and starting to make some sense of who should be accountable and responsible. But not all states have them and, and they vary. So you can almost think of this as a big giant set of experiments about what's going to work and what's not. And it's not just cars. As we start looking increasingly for drones, you know, Amazon will have drones delivering to our house. We'll think about drones uh, in use in, uh, you know, agriculture and the military and lots of other places. Um, we're really going to have to start thinking about who is responsible for the behavior of these drones and what happens when something goes wrong. Something goes wrong with human beings all the time, but we've kind of, we kind of have fleshed out what it means and who might res be responsible and accountable. For autonomous systems, we don't have that sense yet. So another area that we're going to have to figure out laws and policy for is uh, openness and privacy, right? What should be private and what shouldn't be private? Who should control and have access to your information and who can't? So right now, if you think about surveillance, surveillance is something that we use in really positive ways and has been used in really negative ways as well. And so if you have you know, aging parents or grandparents, um, surveillance system often let them stay in their home for longer than they would have because their kids look in on them and they make sure that everybody's OK and stuff like that. But um, surveillance systems have also been hacked to scream at babies, right? 
the systems don't know the difference. It's they've just been used for positive and for negative. So the technologies themselves, what kind of policy and security are they going to allow? And what are your own rights to the data you generate or the data that's generated about you or to other people's data? Who should be able to see your data? And under what circumstances? Is it OK any time for people to see your data? Is it OK for people to see your data in an emergency only? And what constitutes an emergency? Is it OK for a bot to see your data? Is it OK for the government to see your data? Is it OK for um, the company that, you, that provides a service to see your data? So we actually really don't have a good sense about what that is. Now, in the EU, for those of you that um, spend a lot of time with your European colleagues, they're really trying to figure out a whole notion of digital rights. So there's a whole digital rights part of the European Commission, and there's a number of laws there. Um, individual rights matter a lot in that environment. So there's another experiment to what happens when individual rights prevail over, say, a company's rights. And we're trying a different kind of experiment in this country. So one of the things we're going to have to keep track of is what's really important. Now, we can't go all the way, or, we, or maybe we should go all the way, that everything is private. First of all, that, that doesn't really give you the benefit of the Internet of Things. But we've kind of agreed to the giving up of some data. If you go, uh, if you go out of the country and you come back, the border agents will ask you if you've been on a farm, right? And you, you need to get, tell them the information about whether you've been on a farm or not. That's, that's information you give them for the public good because they don't want you to bring in diseases that will be bad for animals or people or something like that, or they want to check you out or they want to take your fruit or whatever. But um, so a lot of times we allow our personal information to be made public for the public good. Um, but where does that line lie? And where does it lie within the Internet of Things? We can think about, you know, in some sense, if the Internet of Things provides a society for us, what are our rights in those society? Imagine that you had to write a bill of rights around the Internet of Things. So what are your rights? Uh, right to be forgotten, that's a right that, uh, that if you're in Europe that you have, and that basically means you have a right, to, um, you have a right for um, it to be hard to discover you, right? It, you can't actually be forgotten. You can't actually take all the stuff off the Internet. But you can make it hard, uh, you, can, you can remove the links to it, right? So you have to know where to go. And that right to be forgotten is something that goes smack dab against, uh, in some sense, your right to sort of say what you like. So it, if somebody, if you say something bad about somebody um, and, and they, they use that right to be forgotten, in some sense that goes against um, the right of free speech. So we're going to get all of these kind of philosophical um, problems. Right to privacy. Right? Do you have a right to privacy, and what would that mean? Um, if I, uh, if I uh, you know, want to keep all the information about myself private, does that mean I can take it out of public information that makes that public information more, uh, less useful for you? If I don't want you to know where I live and I take out my address from Google Maps and Google Maps have me taking my uh, address out, Google Maps become uh, uh, less useful for us. So there's all kinds of interesting things to think about. Do we have a right to opt out? Talk a little bit about that in the next slide. Do, do humans have a right to prevail over the intention of autonomous systems, right? So I have a system. My refrigerator is talking to my grocery store. My grocery store is sending my food. My grocery store tells my insurance company, God, all Fran buys are like cookies and wine. So now my, uh, you know, now my, gross, my insurance company think, well, Fran's likely to be an alcoholic and have diabetes, so I'm going to raise her rates, right? Can that happen without me knowing about it? So there's all kinds of crazy scenarios. And by the way, I don't buy too much cookies of mine, just if you, in case you're curious. But, um, uh, but there's all kinds of scenarios where things can go on without our knowledge. Lots of times, that's real benefit to us. But lots of times, it's not. So when, how are we going to kind of get a sense about and an awareness of that? One question you have is, you know, can you opt out of the IoT? And, you know, in some sense, you may not be able to opt out of the IoT. You're going to be in a lot of environments where there's surveillance. Uh, there are going to be a lot of services that are only available online to us. And so we, if we want to live in society, there will be a digital footprint for us. And if there's a digital footprint for us, 
The question is, you know, what is our control over that data? What is our privacy around that data? What are we going to allow and what are we not going to allow? And so it's, it's kind of interesting to really think about an environment where you may not even be able to opt out. You know, what do you do when you want to protect uh, certain kinds of information about you? Another question to ask is, you know, which decisions should be made by technology, right? So these systems will be increasingly run in the background, you know, in this crazy scenario where I gave you where my, you know, refrigerator's talking to my grocery store or talking to my insurance company. That can all run in the background. And a lot of our systems do run in the background. We trust them to sort of support the services they want to. But one of the things that we're finding with the IoT as we make some experiments with it um, is there's a lot of inadvertent things that can happen. There are a lot of consequences that can happen when they're used cleverly by people who had sort of different ideas in mind. So how do we design devices, software, policy, regulation, behaviors in the IoT to support the things we want to support but not support the things we don't want to support? And what happens when, when they don't do the right thing, right? Who's responsible? What are we going to do about that? Now, this gets to sort of an interesting question for those of you science fiction fans who read Isaac Asimov many years ago, and, and he indeed wrote many years ago. Um, he was thinking about rules for robots and their interaction with humans. And uh, in his books, uh, he came up with, you know, basic uh, rules which humans could basically, the welfare of humans could basically prevail over the welfare of robots. Well, um, for those of you that ever saw 2001, which by now is a very old movie, but a really good movie to sort of think about, you know, HAL 9000 and how HAL 9000 took HAL 9000's own best interests over the interests of the astronauts. So what happens when you actually have technologies and systems and robots and all of that, which can become smarter, which can become almost self-determining? And how do they interact with human beings in the Internet of Things? And how do we regulate that so we stay on top? So it's not really an equal society. We want to, you know, I want to be like, I want to count more than my toaster, right? You might want to count more than my toaster too. So how do we put that, how do we put some sort of regulatory framework, some sort of governance framework uh, in, in play for that? And in some sense, you, the way you can think about it is, you know, it's really up to us to do this. It's up to us to, to design the software, to design the hardware, to design the rules and the policies, to experiment with them, to really think about what are intended consequences versus unintended consequences, because the technology itself has no ethics. You know, it's like your, your refrigerator is just doing that really cool thing having to do with sort of responding to the input, you know, the re you, your refrigerator doesn't know that it's a pawn in a denial of service attack, right? Nor does your toaster, nor does your computer, nor does your TV, nor does anything that you have to do. They don't know whether this is a good thing that they're sending or a bad thing they're sending in your estimation. So the technology itself, it's just technology. It doesn't have ethics at all. And the use of that technology, it's up to us. How can we make sure that it's, it's used in a good way? Now, when we think about IoT ethics, it's kind of interesting because as systems get smarter and smarter, as we start thinking about artificial intelligence, now we might start thinking about artificial ethics. So I have a self-driving car, and the self-driving car is going down the street, and something terrible happens, and it has to either crash into a school bus or a, you know, a storefront that has people you know, eating breakfast in the front. How does it make that decision? That's a crappy decision to make. You know, if I was driving a car, it would be a bad decision for me to make too. But how does the system make that decision? And what happened if there was a human being in the car who could have intervened? Are they responsible for that? And how do we help those systems have ethics? And when we do, whose interests should they represent and whose ethics should they be? So it turns out that it's a really complicated set of issues. What we like is for the, the machines and the ethics to support the common good, right? That's what society is all about, is promoting uh, the advantage of all of us. But it's really hard to, when you get down to the details of what that means and how to change your systems, very difficult to figure out. So what I, I guess what I'm basically trying to say is, 
in this brave new world, and it is a brave new world, and we're going headlong into it, and it's going to be you know, the best of times. We want to make sure it's not the worst of times, too. Um, there really is a need for very serious thought about what are the principles, what are the rules, um, can we do some prototypes, can we do some experiments, can we try some things out um, in order to really create an effective, useful, um, advantageous um, ethical framework. Now, part of this is, you know, many of you might be working for companies, and right now companies are really ahead of the curve. Um, uh, on the IoT. They're building devices. Those devices are amazing. They're being used by a lot of people. But in some sense, it's going to take a really deep relationship between, in some sense, the keeper of the public good, which is the public sector, the academic sector, et cetera, and the private sector to be able to sort of figure out what's the right, what's the right integration and coordination of both the social side and the technical side of the Internet of Things. Lots of people are starting to think about that. Um, transportation is a big area, but you're finding that in addition to the Europeans and the National Institute for Standards and Technology in the U.S., um, there's a lot of sort of think tank type groups, Aspen in Institute, Rand Corporation, et cetera, that's starting to think about it. But we really need to get those voices louder as we start to build out um, the IoT. Now, when you want to get really crazy, you think beyond that. So now we've got a society. And in this society, there's a bunch of different kinds of entities. And you know, they, they go from you know, me my, to my toaster to, uh, you know, to some system or something like that. So you can start thinking, what's the ethnography of the Internet of Things? How do these different cohorts interact with each other? And you know, who are the citizens? And this whole notion of equality um, becomes really sort of crazy because we want to prevail over systems, but how does that sort of change the way uh, things happen? So and the other piece of it that I think is really interesting to think about is how is this going to impact the planet? You know, how much rare earth do we need for the IoT, right? How many, how many, how are the resources? And how can the IoT sort of contribute to a better planet, a more sustainable planet, instead of a planet where we're using resources faster? So with that, uh, I, will, uh, I will say again uh, the bottom line, which is that I think the social and technical development of the IoT really has to happen together. And so as we do the really thrilling, amazing technological um, breakthroughs that help us create a more coordinated IoT, a more effective IoT, a more adaptive IoT, a more intelligent IoT, we ought to think about how we want to use all of the devices and systems in the IoT and how we can do it for um, both our individual good and the greater good. With that, I thank you. Questions? Have you been able to raise any of these concerns in your work with the National Council on the Humanities? Oh, that's a really interesting question. Um, yeah, I have a little bit um, because um, uh, the question was about, um, I was appointed to the, um, uh, I don't know, maybe the only technologist on the, um, on the uh, National Endowment for the Humanities Council. And it's been a fascinating, um, right? And of course, they do digital humanities and they worry about data stewardship and preservation in museums and libraries and all kinds of things. Um, it's interesting that the social sciences and the humanities um, think a lot about now using technology to advance their work. And so they want to, for example, do um, uh, you know, a historical archive or they want to provide an environment where you know about a neighborhood through narratives and stuff like that. But now we're starting to see some of the issues that happen when things go online. What happens to privacy, right? If I talk to the people in my neighborhood and they've said things, now I put those things online, and, and what does that mean in terms of the privacy of the individuals that they talk to, and how that interacts with other pieces of data, and how that's used. So um, what I find is that um, the humanities community, which is a pretty amazing community, is starting to think about these issues too, but they have a really different lens. And, um, and it's, it's interesting that as they, 
The social science stuff, uh, Vince Cerf and I wrote an article recently on some of these issues, and it was in the um, February CACM. And I found all kinds of interesting people on the Twitterverse, um, uh, you know, saying things about it. And some of them were from philosophy departments, some of them were ethicists, some of them were social scientists, some of them were, you know, futurists worried about technology. It was a really different crowd than you might uh, usually see. So um, I do think there's a kind of an awakening interest in a lot of communities, including the humanities. But I think, I think we have to do a lot more serious work before we really put laws in a place. The worst thing is to put a law in a place without having any experience level, right? Because it's going to affect a lot of things and a lot of people. You don't really know how it's going to work out. It's better to have a good experience base and then sort of get a sense about what kind of law you want to write. Um, thank you for your talk. Um, I, so I've been, you, at the end of your talk, you were mentioning the sort of divide between the politics and the technology where the politicians maybe try to claim that they know what's going on under the hood of what's happening in the technological world and will make sort of policies to kind of promote some sort of agenda, whereas people on the technological side will think that, oh no, they're oversimplifying the issue and they don't really know the nuances of what would happen if such an, a policy would be enacted. In your opinion, what, how important do you think it is for someone who has a very technical background to enter the public domain? Um, there's news of, say, like Mark Zuckerberg running for president possibly in 2020. <laughs> how, how important do you think Zuckerberg that is? Um, um, and if so, if it is important, how do you get more people on the, who are kind of more trained on the technical side to enter the public domain? It is a, this, it's a great question, really, because um, I, I don't know, this, there's 314 group, maybe some of you, I, I don't know, I've started getting emails from them, and I don't know how they got my name, but um, these are people who um, are trying to get people with a scientific or technical background to run for um, elected office, you know, Congress or the Senate or whatever. And, um, and what they say, which is true, is that very few people in um, Congress and the Senate um, have technical backgrounds. We have very few medical doctors, we have very few engineers, we have you know, very few scientists. And if you think about the kind of legislation that, that Congress is going to be looking at increasingly of the future, it takes a pretty sophisticated sense. Net neutrality is a really good example. I don't know how many of you saw John Oliver's uh, um, uh, thing on YouTube about it. It was really great. If you haven't, go look at it. It probably explained it to more people than anything else. But net neutrality is a really important issue. And um, there's so many people who couldn't even weigh in on one side or another, who, you know, stakeholders, people who need to make decisions, because it's really complicated. And it really takes um, somebody being able to explain it to the world of non-specialists. That's the most important thing, in my opinion, honestly, that all of us do. All of us who have some sort of technical background to sort of explain the issues in a way that makes sense to people who don't have a technical background. Um, because these are issues that involve us all. You know, if you're a parent and you get a baby monitor, you're not happy if someone's screaming at your baby. You know, if you're driving a self-driving car and you're in an accident, you're not happy if you don't know what's going on. If all of a sudden your internet bill goes up and you don't know why, um, you know, you're probably not happy about that either. And so these, these are issues that we see in our daily lives, not just our work lives, all the time. And it's really important for um, people who make decisions, stakeholders in our communities, whether they be in Congress and government, uh, whether they be in, uh, you know, our, uh, uh, the police force or the stakeholder communities or wherever, um, it's really important for them to enter, understand the technologies they are dealing with, um, the benefits those technologies can bring, and the limitations those technologies can bring. So I think that's the most important job we all can do, is make sure people really understand that. And run for office. Feel free to run for office. Hi. Uh, uh, Hi. I have a quick question about uh, you. You mentioned a lot about what kind of policies would be good to implement, but uh, I think the question might come into how would we enforce it? Um, specifically with the drone community, uh, they've been around for about 10 years and technically they were all illegal. 
for the first seven or eight years. And people just said, since it's illegal, we'll do it. And if they catch me, then I'll find a way to pay it. Um, and then the pilot community came in and tried to lobby hired against it because they were worried about losing their jobs. Um, I think that's also happening with the self-driving uh, cars where it's not just people are afraid of them crashing, it's people who do trucking for a living who are worried about losing their jobs, so they're lobbying against it. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering if there's a balance in between enforcing these right away because we're worried about it and taking time to see how it evolves. Yeah, um, uh, I think there is a balance, but you also brought up another thing that is, I think it's really useful. This is a big topic, and uh, of course, you know, the most important thing is to come up with your own answers uh, uh, for where you stand on this, but there's been a lot of discussion about whether the rise of technologies are just eliminating, you know, are we going to become a leisure class in, you know, a decade or two because machines will be doing everything for us. And um, that's an important one to think through because I think it will change the workforce. I mean, arguably, every time there's been a new technology, you know, it's changed things a lot. You only have to look at the Industrial Revolution when you had factories, when you had a move to the cities, when you had, you know, iron manufacturing for the first time. And you look at all the big things that happened technically, but perhaps the biggest thing that happened was the social changes. It was the first time you saw child labor laws, for example. It was the first time you could get goods and services sort of at scale. You know, you went from kind of a craftsman space to a manufacturing space. And so all those changes made a difference. Now, maybe you could have said, well, uh, you know, I don't want to, I don't want, I want to keep doing these things the way I did. I don't want to use the manufactured iron or something. And there was a transition, just like there's a transition now. So there is a transition, and different skills are going to be required as we go forward. Um, and it, so in some sense, we're just reenacting what always happens when there are new technologies. But in another way, um, the pervasiveness and ubiquity of the devices and the changes that we're going to see with technology and the Internet of Things, that really is going to call for us to be really smart about how we go forward. And I think that's just going to be an, an, an important thing to think. You know, I don't think we're going to become a complete leisure class, but I do think, you know, our kids and our grandkids, you know, the people coming through the school systems in the next 10 or 20 years, they're going to need really different things. You know, 10 years ago, we didn't have a lot of programs in data science, right? And we had people interested in data, but we didn't have a lot of problem, uh, programs in data science. I think that that's going to become a really fundamental core part of an education in the next 10 years. Thank you. You're welcome. So you briefly mentioned about ethics of artificial intelligence. So can you illustrate a bit more about it? What kind of work is going on about ethics of artificial intelligence? Well, that's interesting because um, one of the things I want to do, uh, this is an area I'm pr particularly interested in, and I've been getting together with a lot of colleagues around it. and. You know, there's not a lot of literature that I know of, and feel free to send me anything for my reading list. I've been sort of putting together a reading list on ethics and machines. There's stuff in sort of science fiction-y stuff, and in the social sciences and humanities, there's, there's some stuff. But I don't see a lot of it sort of being applied to, say, today's technologies in the way we all probably live it in the, say, computer science-enabled um, uh, space. And I do think this is an area that's going to have to become more and more important. And of course, you know, it's, it's uh, ethics are things that people ha are subjective in some sense. You know, what you think is good and what I think is good, maybe there's a lot of overlap and maybe there's things you think are good that I don't and vice versa. And so when we want to imbue an ethics, put an ethics module in a machine, have it support different policies. Um, you know, we're going to have to really think about what those are and how we're going to match it with the kind of use it's going to have and the kind of uh, operation it's going to have. And I, I just think that's, it's really, there's a lot of new stuff to be thought about there. In terms of putting an ethics module in a machine, um, so in that case of the self-driving car having to choose between two horrible situations, if uh, philosophers haven't been able to solve the trolley problem or come up with like a unified system of ethics for 400 years, how will Mark Zuckerberg or some CS <laughs> professor, you know, or a consortium yeah, of yeah. professors and humanities uh, individuals be able to upload a module? 
Well, I, you know, I, I think, um, I mean, it's interesting. I, I think if we um, hold ourselves to the bar that there's some sort of perfect ethical system that we've never seen before, before we add ethics to things, that's not going to work. I think, you know, uh, entities in the Internet of Things will operate like we do, which is they'll have, you know, whatever level of ethics they have, and, and they'll try to sort of get better over time. Um, so, you know, I don't know. Um, it may be that we don't put any ethics modules at all, but, but that, that car that has to make that decision is going to have to make it in some way. And we, we have, we write that program, right? So it, it, we've imbued it uh, indirectly, perhaps not directly, with our own ethics somehow. So the question is, do we want to make that more explicit, and do we want to actually look through a set of things um, and, and look at different scenarios? If I could intervene, you know, do I? So, uh, you know, I, I don't think we're going to get perfect on that, but... Yeah, I basically had the same exact example as the previous question, but maybe I can, I mean, aren't the ethics very also society dependent? So like, to give an example, like when I lived on the East Coast, I wouldn't be able to go swimming in the ocean unless there was a lifeguard on duty. But on the West Coast, you know, do whatever you want, right? Like no lifeguard necessary, do, you know, you can go in. So, you know, in those two cases, on the, you know, on one, in one case, they say, okay, it's dangerous for you, we won't let you do it. In the other case, they say, okay, it's up to you to decide whether you think it's dangerous or not. So, I mean, I think, I mean, isn't it true that some questions just have no kind of answer that everyone can agree on? Well, I, I think that's a, uh, yeah, I mean, I think the answer is sort of yes in a way. I mean, there are fundamental things. Um, and then there are things that are really society dependent. So if you go in different cultures throughout the world, some cultures think it's okay to eat cows and other cultures don't. Um, some cultures think that dogs should be pets and other ones think that dogs should be edible. Um, you know, so you see your mileage varies a lot and different communities create their own ethical framework. If you think about something like incest, right? There's most, I don't know of any society in which that's okay. So there's, there are some things that are kind of, um, with respect to ethics, more common, let's say, and I don't know, you know everything about this, but there's things that are more common to communities and there's things that are very community dependent. I think that will be, you know, I, I don't think that will be different in the Internet of Things. It may be for certain classes of scenarios, you know, there'll be certain ethical frameworks that are uh, available to us or that we'll use. And then for other kind of, uh, Maybe, maybe we decide in some way that we can actually actuate that human beings are more important than machines. Say we decide that, that that's a tenet of our, our ethical framework. Then maybe that's more common than, say, other kinds of things. But I, I really do think that, um, I don't think we'll be able to do things socially in the Internet of Things that we can't do, you know, as in human societies. But I do think that when we map the things we do in human societies, and the way that entities interact onto, onto environments that have machines, systems, devices, as well as humans, then I think things get, you know, it gets complicated. Um, sorry to still be on the self-driving car trolley problem. Oh, it's fine. But um, so in that situation where you have to make two I'm glad two, you guys stay up at night thinking, up, <laughs> thinking about these things too. I mean, in that situation where you have to make two decisions that are both undesirable, I think, you know, sometimes what you see, certainly in superhero movies and Star Trek and sometimes in the news, is that a human gets a burst of adrenaline and doesn't even consciously decide what they're doing, but they do something crazy that they saw in a stunt driving ad or something, and somehow, you know, they don't kill anyone in the car. And they get, you know, because it's adrenaline, they get this, you know, reaction time that they don't normally have and could never repeat. How, how could that, I mean, I don't really see that possible in a self-driving car, or do you think there's any way that we can, I don't know, can we build that in somehow? Well, you write the program, so how would you write a program for that car? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I think at the end of the day, all of these systems, we write the systems. At least currently we're writing the systems. So, 
you know, we can write the systems any way we want. And, you know, every time you write a program, there are some desirable outcomes, and then there are other things you want to kind of like cut off because they're not a desirable outcome. And, you know, this is the same kind of situation, I think. And, and I think for us, you know, the genie's out of the bottle. It's, it's not like you're going to stop the Internet of Things. I think the, and, uh, and I don't think we would want to stop the Internet of Things. But I think this is a really great time for us to be really thoughtful about it and thoughtful about the kind of programs we write and, um, and what those programs can do and the kind of ways we want to inter interact with it so we can get the best of it. So, but we write the programs. Uh, talking about the trolley problem or the self-driving car accident problem, <laughs> even in that stark situation, out of the two, there is one which is, which is harming more people than the other. So if that calculation can be made, then practically that, has, that is the decision that has to be taken, right? No. Uh, well, uh, if you're asking me for, you know, I am not like the, the lord of the, or the lady, I guess, of the Internet of Things. So, um, um, but uh, I don't think so. I mean, for me, it's not the number of people because I think it's more complicated. If my kids are in one of those things, I'm making, I know how I'm making the decision. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and by the way, I'm saving my kids. I just want to point that out. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, it may be that, uh, I mean, a lot of things come into your mind. Or, or maybe, I, maybe I think I have a better chance of saving the people in the school bus than I do in the storefront. Because, you know, they're sitting outside and I'll hit them directly, whereas, you know, whatever. Um, I think there's a lot of things people go through when they make those ethical decisions. I don't think it's just the number of people. So when you try to program something like that in, it, it, you know, it's hard to do. But it'll be interesting, because you're writing the program. So what, what do you just like do the absolute value of number of people? And well, yeah, so, <laughs> so, if, if I was, so if I was given the problem and I have to come up with the answer, I will calculate the risks, basically. Right. And whichever is, is less risky, I will take that decision. Right. Think about this from the marketing point of view. I'm going to buy the great Toyota's AV cruiser, and it will sacrifice you instead of a school bus? I'm going to buy the car that will kill me? I mean, these, I, I spend a lot of time in the autonomous vehicle space right now. And these are the things that are keeping the automobile manufacturers up late at night. Because imagine the first time a car goes into a tree at a high speed, killing the occupants of the car instead of the kid walking in the middle of the road. And, you know, that's going to be a mess. So think about it. Are you going to sit in a piece of technology that will willingly kill you <laughs> if, if a complex situation comes up? It's, this is a mess. We have, we have no solutions, and I, I think we have to think of it in terms of liability law. Because right. ethics, if I, and I talk to philosophers about this, and you ask a philosopher, the ones I've been talking to, about can I write an ethical robot, can I design an ethical robot? And they laugh at that. It's like, no. You know, a robot, an inanimate object, by definition, cannot be ethical. It's the human writing the program who is or is not ethical. And we have to keep coming back to that. Okay, how do we deal with ethics in humans? It's liability law. Mm -hmm. So we have to have the legal framework in place so that if you build the car that takes out the school bus and kills 50 kids, <laughs> it, it goes to the courts. It, it's a mess. It's a mess. I have a lot of respect for people like you who are willing to work on it. <laughs> It, it occurs to me this wasn't probably our best dinner conversation, but you know. Let's thank our speaker. <laughs> <laughs>